Uh, I'm Ted Parson. I'm a professor here at UCLA Law School, where, among my other jobs, I direct the AI Pulse Project, which examines the legal and policy implications of AI and related technologies. I'm delighted to welcome you all to today's web conversation, which is sponsored by the AI Pulse Project and the University of Arizona's Tech Law Program. Our topic today is alternative payment and business models for the internet. Is the presently dominant advertising model fundamentally flawed or doomed? And if so, what alternative approaches are most promising? And in particular, does the model of small, whether you call them mini, micro, or nano payments for small transactions, have promise despite the number of criticisms that have been advanced against it and the disappointing experience of several early attempts to roll it out? Um, our starting point for this conversation is a couple of essays by David Brin, which we circulated along with the invitation, and David's going to start us off today. David is an astrophysicist and a renowned science fiction author, as well as an award-winning author of a non-fiction book on the information age, The Transparent Society. So in David's two uh, essays, he answers our two questions, yes and yes, but with uh, some important wrinkles and differences from past efforts. Now, in conversation with David, we're fortunate to have three remarkably creative uh, thinkers who also happen all to be law professors. Jane Bambauer is a professor at the University of Arizona, where she studies the social impact of big data and the impact of privacy laws. Mark Lemley is a professor at Stanford Law, where he directs Stanford's program in law, science, and technology. And my colleague Eugene Volokh, professor at UCLA Law and well-known blogger on legal issues. A uh, couple of very brief housekeeping notes before we launch. Uh, our total time here is just 60 minutes. David is going to lead us off with some opening remarks of five to seven minutes, and then we'll move to a conversation among the panelists to a total of about 20 or 25 minutes, and then continue through the remainder of the hour with uh, the discussion with input from attendees' questions. If you're attending and you want to submit a question, please use the Zoom question and answer screen, not the chat, not the hand raise function. Uh, I will serve up questions to the speakers and keep us on time, including ending us sharp at three o'clock as planned. That's all I have to say. And so now let's get started. May I turn it over to David, please? Uh, yes, thank you very much. Excellently done. And I'm honored to be uh, in the company of such distinguished um, seers and, and sages on on this civilization and its and its dedication to law and not capricious um, whim by by uh, by the ruling by any kind of ruling class um, of course the internet was projected to be one of the great liberators and it is in many ways and probably will be but we need to look back across history and realize that every generation in Western civilization has had crises caused by new communication abilities. The printing press expanded what we can know um, it, so that we would have information outside our head. Literacy did that, but only for a small clerk class up until that point. Um, and the eyeglasses, glass lenses expanded what we can see and perspective expanded what we can uh, pay attention to. And since then, there have been expansions of vision and knowledge and, and perspective, uh, attention, that, that have overwhelmed what came before. And always op pessimists said human beings can't deal with that. And optimists said this is going to expand what it means to be human. And both were always right in that order. Always the new technology messed things up badly at first. The printing press was absolutely horrible influence on the religious wars of Europe. Uh, radios and loudspeakers virtually destroyed human civilization in the 30s and 40s. The only exception is television, which arguably did far more good than harm. And we could talk about that separately. Now the internet is driven by this desire to have all this wonderful good stuff and floundering around for how to eliminate the problems of anonymity without getting rid of the advantages of anonymity. And that's a whole other topic that we can talk about another time. But one of the pernicious influences has been that the internet has largely been paid for by advertising, which has had many influences. First of all, it's robbed traditional uh, news media of uh, their major funding source. So news has, has uh, 
fallen into really serious trouble. Second, it has naturally uh, follows a Marxist pattern of this capitalist uh, activity getting narrower and narrower and narrower in its consolidation into a few uh, narrow uh, companies and groups that rake in everything and all the other uh, players are crushed. But there's a fun, more fundamental reason, and, and it's pernicious on its influences on what is contained in the internet. But there's a, there's a and, and it's na unpleasant for all of us. We all do what we can to avoid the advertising. And of course, the targeting of us to try to sell us specific things um, has been a real problem. Um, because it, it, it implies that the gathering of our information uh, follows an Orwellian path, though arguably not as harmful as in 1984 because they're just trying to sell us stuff for now. The fundamental reason why this can't maintain reasons are, are, have been given by many people, like for instance, the amount of money is insufficient to maintain all the participants. Um, and advertising is being evaded better and better. But the main reason why it won't continue is this. The aggregators are getting better and better at using our information to target ads at us. You know that if you just searched for something without it even trying to buy anything, um, that thing will start showing up on your ad feed in Facebook and other places. Um, they'll, they, they predict what you're going to want with uncanny accuracy, but here's the deal. As these algorithms get better and better and more and more compact, they are going to be fittable on your own devices, your Alexa or your phone. And when that happens, that some assistant of yours, AI assistant of yours, can parse and know and predict what it is that you're going to want as well as Google and YouTube do, when they advertise to you, then what you've got is a shopping assistant and you have absolutely no need for it to be obnoxiously push from Gab uh, Google and, and I said Gabble and Amazon and all these things. As a matter of fact, your irritation with that level will go up vastly. Um, so when you have a shopping assistant that can follow your parameters to say, do you wanna see this? Do you wanna see that? There is no basis for the advertising model to continue. In any event, can, for all of those reasons, can there be an alternative? The principal alternative that has been discussed over the years has been to just let people pay. Now, people pay for tangible goods through eBay and PayPal. They, they pay uh, for things. They pay for tangible things and they get them. And this has worked very well. But for the smaller intangible purchases, like for instance, getting to read a New York Times article, they have tried silos. Uh, you can't read this article unless you uh, sign in to, uh, to your paid silo and pay a subscription. The biggest reason why people don't want to do those silos is not the amount of money. They'd be willing to pay $10 a year. They'd be willing to pay a nickel per article. But there are so many silos that they'd rather pay a nickel per article than join all these silos. The biggest reason they don't want to do, get, inv get involved in any of that and they surf onward and they find alternatives and aggregators is because they don't want to interrupt the surfing experience. If it's one click, they would be willing to look to pay a nickel or a quarter or a dime to read a New York Times article that they read the first paragraph and it's somewhat interesting. This has been attempted at least two dozen times, micropayments, and it's always failed because they have followed the wrong models. And if you'd like, we can talk about why this failure has happened again and again and again. Um, and they're trying to uh, go for a system that's similar to PayPal when it is absolutely the opposite in every way. And the secret sauce for making micropayments work, at least as I assert in those two uh, articles on Evonomics. Evonomics, by the way, is a wonderful site in which Adam Smith comes alive and proved that today he'd be a flaming liberal. Um, <laughs> the, the Evonomics, uh, on Evonomics, my, my uh, papers discussed 
one fundamental, and that is that um, micropayment systems can be made much easier using a different approach that would retain the one-click capability that people want when they're surfing. And they would then be willing to press a nickel button, press a dime button, press a quarter button. And we can talk about that, but I have blabbed and blabbed and blabbed too long. Oh, so, okay, and, and you've left us on the very edge of desperately wanting more because you've said there's one piece of the secret sauce that's missing and you haven't shared it, but what a great point to turn it over to a conversation among our other speakers. So uh, to the extent that you folks uh, are comfortable just doing so, I'll stay out of the way as moderator. I'll, you know, at a certain point, I'll start coming with questions and so on, but off you go. So, David, you don't want to tell us the secret sauce, yes? <laughs> of course I do. It's just, I, I do enough blabbing online and, I, and at science fiction conventions and at the CIA, for heaven's sake, this is the first year in five I haven't been there. Um, he wants you to ask for it. <laughs> that one, a, a gentleman waits to be asked. I mean, or we can also jump in to talk about the premise for a little bit before you reveal. Great. Mark, you're muted. Let, let's do that, right? I mean, because I, I, I mean, I think the premise is an important one, right? But you might start with the, um, with the sort of I don't know received fact that people have been saying for a long time advertising will die, and it hasn't, right? Uh, and I wouldn't, if you'd asked me sort of ten years ago, right, would Google's advertising revenues continue to be rising quarter after quarter? I would have said, of course not. That's ridiculous, right? The market can't sustain that much. Uh, now. That doesn't mean I think that, uh, that David's wrong, right? Either that we do re reach a logical stopping point at some point or that um, the ability to sort of personalize uh, and, and control our own um, uh, data information may preempt this. But it is, uh, you know, it is interesting to me, or not just that micropayment systems have failed, but that advertising has so far been so successful uh, on the internet. Well, well I I mean, it's, I, 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 who, who pays attention to these ads? I mean, I like to think I'm really good at ignoring them. Maybe I'm not. Uh, but I'm shocked that, that they seem as effective as they are, because you'd think that people would be so annoyed by them that, you know, they just look at uh, the stuff and do some of it. But here I do think the targeting makes a difference, right? Well, um, I, I, yeah, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, I think the, um, the one thing that the internet brought as an advertising innovation model that all previous advertising didn't have is the ability to modulate that ad to you and to the things you are interested in. So the answer is, you know, I like to ignore most ads on, uh, on the internet, um, but I also buy stuff off Facebook all the time because they've got my number. They know exactly the geeky t-shirt that I'm going to want. Um, because they've paid enough attention to me. And that's something that no television channel uh, right. is ever going to have. Jane, you had something? Well, did, I, I, so I, I think all of those, uh, those observations are right. And also I object, I guess, to the assumption, which is broadly shared, but I just still think is wrong, that the t advertising and especially targeted advertising is pernicious. Uh, that... Uh, I mean, so first of all, just in terms of understanding the economics and how important it is for the content creators, it clearly is important because, you know, the revenue that they bring in from being able to offer ta t tailored advertising is like, you know, something like 60% higher than with just contextual advertising alone. But also from the consumer side, uh, consumers... Um, you know, I, I, I'm not, I think there are descriptive accounts that are, are um, varied here, but at least some studies seem to suggest that people are not increasingly annoyed, that in fact they're decreasingly annoyed at advertising for rough, roughly the same reasons that their personal shopper idea would be likely to take off. But the personal shopper idea, unless people really understand what types of information are relevant for getting to the right product and for learning about products that they don't even know about, um, even the personal shopper may not be able to outperform Google. Well, I think that uh, the personal shopper, when it comes along, will, will, will be, um, there will be services that will help to, uh, questionnaire you so that your algorithm, your Alexa algorithm will work properly and possibly avoid some of your addictions. 
But uh, we're all aware of, of dark Hollywood warnings about uh, where push advertising that's highly tailored could lead. We're all, we all recall that scene from uh, Minority Report in which Tom Cruise has replaced his eyeballs and by reading his irises, the, the, the holograms are leaping out at him. Mr. Yakamoto, have you tried the new Tesla? Which is, of course, an anachronism. Um, the, the point is that we're already tuned to worry about uh, accumulations. I have an essay about this, if you put in my name, and the idiot plot. I explain why Hollywood goes after these uh, failure mode scenarios, and it's actually been fairly wholesome in many ways. But of course, I have agreed with you many times, Jane, that when people get overly paranoid about Google and uh, these others aggregating your information in the near term, um, what, they, they want to sell you something? This is not Orwell. It can become Orwell which is why moving as much away from push, which is what we saw in the minority report, into a form of autonomous pull that's on your Alexa and that's your autonomous decision to tailor your algorithms the way you want them. Uh, that is a trend that I talked about in the Transparent Society um, that is to use- Advertising, the advertising. Yeah, yeah, you know, <laughs> Well, everybody is pre-selected to be interested. Right, right, right. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. Gary, worthwhile advertising, I should add. Yes, yes, yes. I, I didn't see it. My ad blocker put a blank space <laughs> on David's screen. Uh, all right. So in, in, in any event, the point is that uh, I believe the thing that's going to drive the transformation over to micropayments is a multiple set of things. One is... If it increases the fluidity uh, and power of the internet surfer to get what she or he wants with a click, I think that that itself is going to be the attraction uh, that overcomes the cost of a nickel or a dime or a quarter. Once a fair number of people are doing that, then you're going to have a monetary incentive for uh, places like the New York Times or an aggregator uh, that, they're, that they control uh, with, with other um, news media to um, put their thumbs on the scale in favor of direct payment rather than advertising. Uh, because I just wanted to establish that I love your idea and, and because I don't hate advertising, it means that there are reasons to pursue this irrespective of whether people buy into your premise about how bad um, and potentially dangerous tr surveil you know, tracking is going to be. So, well, and so let, me, let me take a slightly different cut at that, right? Because uh, as someone who lived through the transition from uh, broadcast television to cable television, um, we were promised, here is this thing that has always been free, and guess what you're going to pay for it? Well, that doesn't sound like a great deal. What's the trade-off? The trade-off that was promised was you're going to pay for it via cable, but you won't have to look at ads anymore. And we all bought in and we all got cable. And sure enough, we got pay every month and look at ads. Uh, and right? better it turns out, and it turns better out if there's two revenue streams, why not use both of them? So I guess one of the things that I worry about, maybe Jane doesn't worry about it as much, but what I worry about is, you know, yeah, we'll create a micropayments infrastructure, but gosh, there's that space there and we can make extra revenue if we filled it up with ads. Uh, and maybe the answer is content creators get more money and if you're a content creator, great. But I, but I, I worry that um, uh, consumers might end up sort of not getting what they might think of as the benefit of the bargain. Wow. But they do have ad blockers. Science fictional sort of a guy there, Mark. Uh, you look beyond the problem, the solution, to the problem that might evolve in the solution. <laughs> and I think that's a terribly important, because I do that in my novels, my, my near future novels like um, Existence and Earth. I, I very often point out, be careful what you wish for, because you, know, you may get this very thing and, uh, and, and it may have these interesting uh, consequences. Um, but 
uh, in any event, I believe that offering people the option of a micropayment system um, that improves their surfing ability, if not for no other reason than if an article interests them, that a lot of people will uh, grumble that the New York Times article that's interesting only shows the first two paragraphs. You have to sign in to, in order right. to get the rest. So they actually go three or four clicks to a, to a, to a side view aggregator uh, in order to get around it. And mea culpa, I have done that. Um, if you are offering something that simply for a nickel allows them to bypass that, that cheat, and that nickel goes to the New York Times, I think you're talking about a win-win that at least would have some short-term sign-in. Now, I met some of these people. There's a group in, um, in Holland, for instance, that tried one of the latest uh, attempts at micropayments. And it all wound up being a security system um, uh, similar to PayPal and with, a, with essentially silos. In other words, every single, if you try to do micropayments, people are going to say, oh, it never worked. Nobody's going to want to pay for anything. It's not the not willing to pay for anything. It is the rigmarole. And all of them have felt we need to set up a security system similar to PayPal that includes signing in. And that's the calamity. And the secret sauce is to say, no, no. PayPal, you sign in and you're secure because you are dealing with tangible amounts, even if it's just five bucks. And it is for items that are in some way tangible that the person selling it to you doesn't want to lose them. Neither party wants this transaction to hack and they are worried that it might be. So you have sign-ins and you have passwords. In, in just a moment, I'm going to move on to start teeing up some of the fabulous questions that are coming up from other attendees. But before we do that, and before we move completely off denouncing the ad model to examining the details of David's alternative. I want to point out, David, there's a couple of really provocative teasers near the start of your first piece where you identify four fundamental problems, social impacts of the internet. The fourth one is it's filled with advertising and people hate it. And then you say, I'm going to talk about that one because it's powerfully implicated in the first three. Now, we've talked about there's not enough money to sustain businesses, and we've talked about consumers hate it, but we, I don't think I've heard you explicitly talk about how the ad model has contributed to polarization and fragmentation of society, the elevation of sort of violent and extreme discourse, the concentration of political power. If you want to if you want to, in three sentences, say, how is it responsible for those things, too? I think that might be helpful. And maybe strengthen the case against some of the skepticism you're getting from our other panelists that, that it's really fundamentally flawed. Well, well I think how Ted, I, once again, just sort of put the solution off. We were just about to get to the solution. <laughs> well, yeah, 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 I, I know. And we're going to get there. Yeah. Nice, but, nice narrative move. <laughs> right, right, well, right. Let me answer, Ted. I need to know. <laughs> <laughs> you guys know. Yeah. Um, in that a fair amount of the lurid sensationalism on the web today is uh, to attract clickbait to make to get a lot more people looking so that the, your advertising revenues go up um i think there is a uh, definitely a a driver for the um for the lurid um, in that 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 the advertising that advertising helps to drive. I mean, people. Uh, I mean, take a look, for instance. And I, this wasn't even a phenomenon when I wrote the first of these articles. Influencers. Sorry about that. Um, influencers. I mean, good lord. I mean, if nothing else, the the. Uh, bad aspect of that is just the lobotomization at, toward idiocracy. But that it wasn't on my list uh, because that sounds like an crotchety old fart. 
I, I do think you're right about the um, about the um, uh, clickbait problem, though. I I used to write newspaper headlines for a living, and I'm uh, I, I I'm horrified, uh, right? Uh, because it's almost always the case that the newspaper headline has uh, somewhere between 50% and nothing to do with the actual content of the story. Well, the, the, the great example of that is is the only news of the day is that there's a fire going on in the city dump. Um, uh, and 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 seagulls are upset about it, and the headline is um, thousands flee um, uh, foul blades. <laughs> so I take it the argument would be that that would be there wouldn't be as much micropayment bait because if people are drawn in and then have to pay, they'd be less willing to pay if they see that they've been drawn into junk. Whereas their eyeballs still count for ad impressions, even and if you you just segue directly into unless Ted stops. Before we do, yeah, yeah, yeah Jane. <laughs> Jane. Unless Ted stops us. All right, it's Jane. <laughs> this whole event was clickbait. We don't actually have. A <laughs> yeah, that's it. No secret sauce at all. We just with our secret advertising. You're not seeing it, but deep down inside there is. I agree with Mark when it comes to advertising in general, but I don't agree on the distinction between contextual and, um, and targeted advertising. In fact, the lessons from Europe suggest the opposite, that if you're an advertiser and you're trying to figure out which types of eyeballs you're getting, you're actually more interested in clickbaity, maybe clickbait is quite the right um, distinction here, but you're more interested in the kinds of content where by the nature of the content, they're segmenting people more so that, so for example, you know, travel or um, narrow political websites get a different, more interest in advertisers than a general website that's more likely to attract more people. Uh, 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 yes, yes, Jane. Um, uh, and I think that that uh, correlates with one of my complaints. And that is that people are less, at, uh, this encourages Nuremberg rallies these uh, that I talked about in my 1990 novel, Earth, predicting that the web would result in uh, millions of people um, habituating and occupying web spaces that only reinforce um, uh, their, their, uh, their narrow view of the world. And alas, that has come true. Are we ready? <laughs> For the sauce, yes. Yes, okay, so. What you both have been leading, uh, leading into is that, that the security system that destroyed all uh, previous uh, micropayment systems for two reasons. A, it's extremely expensive to start off with a security system that's really um, tight. And secondly, because uh, it will reduce the surfing uh, ability of you of users and there's exactly what you don't want um, to have to sign in the answer is you remove security issue to a different category and that is the New York Times it, its website it shows the first those first two paragraphs you have an option to to sign into the silo or press a nickel button the nickel button will send a signal to your payment, your micropayment system, to send a nickel to the New York Times, that signal at the same time opens up the article. There's no sign in whatsoever. So how do you have any security? How do you prevent being hacked? How do you prevent being robbed? The simple answer is called disavowal. At the end of a week, a day, a month, you get, according to your own parameters, you get a list of all the micropayments that you've made. You may disavow any of them. That's your security. During the first year that you're a member, you can disavow anything free. The second year you're a member, um, you get a hundred free disavowals a month. Um, but it doesn't matter what the boundaries are. It doesn't matter what they are. You get the idea that if the user is responsible for saying, I'm not going to pay that nickel because, A, I don't think I did that click. Somebody hacked me or for a nickel. Uh, or B, um, because that was crap. Um, 
If that's the case, then that sends signals to the system saying, okay, we're going to set a, an algorithm to work finding out if this was hacked and then send this person a warning saying, we don't think you were hacked. Or here's another aspect of the secret sauce. I didn't like that signals going to the New York Times or going to the National Enquirer is data. It's actually interesting data. And micropayments can flow both ways, by the way. If you are providing data along the way to these content providers, there is reason to believe that in the general play of the market, um, you might get a penny for your data. And this is the, the dream that Jaron Lanier talked about 15 years ago that still has not happened. But it ought to, there ought to at least be the possibility that these uh, content providers, that you're clicking the nickel button, that there's a possible that it might be going two ways because you are providing information. And this may be the method to finally provide what Jaron Lanier s said logically ought to be the case. And that is, we all should be paid for information that is of value to these aggregators and these sources. So I don't know that I made disavowal clear. I tried my best, but the main point is that you can set up a micropayment system and spend very, very little on security while the system develops customers. And the first couple of years, the New York Times, it's gonna be just found money. They're not gonna complain about a bunch of disavowals. After three or four years, they're going to rely on this as an income source. They're going to start complaining about all the disavowals. By that point, your system is rolling along. You can figure out something to any of the people listening to this can, could come up with things that they might do about the disavowal system to start making it a little tighter. So let me, let me, let me so, ask about one of the... Oh, I'm sorry, Mark, please ask. And then, Jane, if you have something, and then I think it's time for the Q&A. I, I was going to say, ask you to... <clears throat> respond to sort of the, the sort of one obvious objection from the site owner's site side is going to be, wait a minute, if you can just disavow because you didn't like something, aren't people going to game the system? You're going to go around reading all the stuff you want. You're going to say you're going to pay money and then you just turn it all down. Absolutely. And the reason why you have almost universal disavowal, I, I don't care if it's the first month or the first year, that's up to the, the people who are implementing this thing to try to thrash out and work out. But the reason why you have it uh, free disavowal in the opening period is to attract people to the system. And New York Times would understand that. They have, you know, all your cable companies and your, your, your um, Disney Plus, they all have free one month with free, free two months, uh, Come on. The point is that once you start having this disavowal system and you get past the first period, and some people are trying to be free riders more than other people, what you do is, is, is you start implementing uh, some degree of credibility. And you start saying, hey, look, you know, um, you've said I, these were hacked and you didn't do them. Yeah, all our systems show that it was you. Uh, would you answer this questionnaire so that we can figure out if it really was you? And if it, if it, if it was you, um, you know, you're just going to have to go away if you keep doing this. Uh, this, this can be handled in a fluid way along some sliding scale over the time, over a time period. That's the content providers are going to be very patient with this because let's remember this, the marginal, cost to them of the product that they're selling that some freeloaders are stealing is zero. Now it's true that they, there's comparative opportunity cost versus trying to get people into your silo or paying other ways, but that's just not going to be involved in their minds the first couple of years. This is going to be found money. Now, uh there's a bunch of great questions that are coming that are coming in. Uh, 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 some of them are going back to the criticisms that we were discussing earlier about the ad model, and I think we've moved on, and so it's worth focusing more on uh, this and other proposed solutions. Several of them are proposing alternative models as alternative solutions, but some of them are 
critiquing precisely the micropayments and disavowal proposals. So I'm going to tee up one or two of those first. A couple of people have expressed skepticism that a move to micropayments with disavowal would actually change the incentives related to quality information production, would, would, would in effect diminish incentives for extreme provocative clickbaity, you know, bad journalism relative to the present model. Um, uh, would it really do that or would, you know, revenue streams that get big from a huge number of tiny transactions in that form still have the same perverse incentives? I think that is an absolutely excellent question. Um, the, the number one reason is because the uh, micropayments with disavowal is going to primarily go to those who currently have silos. That's going to be the first bunch of people. Now, who are these people? These are not the clickbaity, um, uh, I'm, I'm going to do something lurid to get you in so that my ad numbers go up and I get more ads. This is not going to be the Nuremberg rallies. The, the first people who are going to put a nickel button or a dime button or a quarter button two paragraphs down are going to be content providers who currently have silos. And those silos are driving people away, not because of the money, but because of the inconvenience. Uh, and that's the main thing about the secret sauce. So I think it's an excellent question. I think it's an excellent concern, but I think the answer to it is that most of the places that will charge a nickel are going to be places that are attractive because they have real content. Yeah. In order to avoid the structure of this turning into questioners pick on David and try to pick holes in his proposal and he defends himself, I want to I say- I don't mind. Yeah, yeah, but do any of the rest of you have thoughts on this broad issue, the, the incentive effects of the alternative uh, model in terms of quality uh, production? So I, I think that the uh, model is going to promote quality production with quality defined as satisfaction to readers. So I think some people, for example, right now who put up their stuff for free are going to put on this little button because what's the downside? And they're going to find that that's actually a good way of raising money from people who really like what they're doing. And if you think those people are, you label them extremists, however you define it, it may be a great way for, for kind of, let's put it more, uh, more uh, 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 neutrally, somebody who has an audience of people who are ideologically committed and likely to say yeah to what they're saying and therefore be willing to support it. So I, my, No, go ahead, please, please finish. I'm not sure that's wrong. In fact, I think, you know, if that means that gun rights supporters and abortion rights supporters and supporters of some particular candidates uh, uh, and uh, end up getting more revenue this way. I don't think there's anything bad, but I, I do think that it isn't necessarily going to promote stuff that's quality to the outsiders that we think, oh yes, this is great reasoning. It's going to promote things that people are willing to pay for, some of which will be good, some of which will be bad. The one thing it'll unite it is it'll be good from the perspective of the payer. Jane yes, and Mark, you're both looking skeptical. Oh, I mean, well, I, I just wanted to say one thing related to that, and that's an aspect of disavowal that is that psychologically extremely important. And that is uh, overcoming buyer's regret. Um, that's not the right term, is it? What is it called? Remorse. Oh, yeah. Re buyer's yeah. remorse. Yeah. Buyer's remorse, right. Exactly. Um, and that actually pay, it, it costs a toll on people surfing on the internet. Um, the, 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 the nickel's worth, if you're paying a nickel, there is a small fear, a microscopic nano fear that you're, that you're paying this for nothing. Disavowal, while still providing data by your disavowal to the content provider, eliminates um, buyer's remorse. And uh, I have seen studies, I cannot cite them right now, that indicate that this kind of thing, if it happens a lot over the course of an evening or a day or a Saturday, um, can really add up on people. Uh, just as the mm. highs that they get from clicking on things that agree with them can add up. 
Uh, you guys had something you want to add? I, I, I feel, yeah, Mark. I feel buyer's remorse after reading free articles for free, so I, I am totally willing to subscribe. Because <laughs> there's no way you can disavow your time, Mark. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. I, I you a refund of your time. I do, I do think one of the things that makes this work if the ecosystem works is that it is at least a little hard and annoying to disavow, right? And, you know, if I didn't spend that much money and I'm a busy person, maybe I'm just going to kind of scroll through the list, but I'm not going to pay that much attention. Or I'll look at the bottom line number and I'll say, well, that doesn't seem uh, crazy to me. Fine. Um, uh, you know, if something annoyed me and I want to make sure, man, I never want these people to get my money. I guess I might go uh, in and, and, and delete it. Um, uh, so, so, so disavowal works on this story, as I understand it, in part because it's at least a little bit hard, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, I think that, that, that um, and what's, each disavowal is trackable in some way. So the intermediary that's got your credit card number uh, and pays, handles all the paperwork and hand, handles the payments. They get data from each disavowal and they pass on the disavowals that are specific to the New York Times to the New York Times. This is actually data that's of sort of real value. So you get your nickel back, but they get some, they get information. And the, it they, could, they, they may even have to pay you more, more than your nickel because exactly. that information is so high value. Yeah. Exactly. It can cause the tide to go the other way by a penny or two. Or um, the intermediary is getting a different kind of value, and that is value about what a freeloader you are. Yeah. Jane, you uh, still look like you're sitting on an objection, and, and we want to hear it. Well, well, we kind of moved on from the initial question about whether this actually solves the kind of splinter net problem, but I'm okay with that because I don't think that this has to solve every problem. Uh, but I'm less worried about disavowal fraud from the individual user, uh, individual users who are paying toward content providers. I'm a little more worried about the payments that come to users uh, based on tracking, because um, I, I think that's, uh, there's something, just thinking about kind of the typical morality or you know the, the moral sort of um, guideposts of a typical internet user I think they're not likely to pretend that they didn't read and enjoy a piece that they actually did but they are at least right now really annoyed at data tracking you know irrespective of the indirect benefits that <laughs> that they may get from it in terms of, of, of um, funding content and so I could imagine some uh, fraud or protests and, and just in the form of of um, of insisting from a bunch of sites that they pay for all the tracking that they're doing. Well, I think that it's terribly important that privacy be protected in the things that you don't disavow. Um, so there's no reason for anybody mm -hmm. to know any of that stuff. Um, but if you disavow, there's a legitimate reason for your intermediary payment company to at least know that your or what your ratio of the disavowals, and whether or not they tell the um, the New York Times that this has happened, well, you know what uh, that can be part of your preferences parameters. Well, so with, that's still with the money going from the users to the content providers, and I'm talking about the money going the other way. So you get to track me, and now I get a penny. Right? Well, so yeah, can, but. Your preferences, supposedly, I, yeah, I mean, this is great stuff for the meeting of the people who are planning how to right. outline the design for this thing. Because it sounds yeah, like disavowal believe, only goes in one direction. I believe that the preferences that you yeah. set can set privacy preferences, uh, providing that the intermediary who's handling the money gets to track at least that one piece of information as to whether or not you're a freeloader. So, Otherwise, I, th I see no reason why it shouldn't be a matter of preferences. There's, a, there's another theme that's emerging in a couple of questions here, which is skepticism about whether a micropayment system, even with disavowal, would actually overcome the barrier that you've identified, the sort of cognitive burden of the transaction and so on. So doesn't a requirement for kind of an affirmative opt-in, even at a microtransaction level, and then particularly getting your monthly report from your intermediary with your 600 transactions and having to go through and click on them, 
that sounds kind of dreary and burdensome to me in terms of cognitive burden. So, well, I think Mark answered that. By the way, that's also an excellent question. I think Mark answered the latter. In Who, whoever said those two, so so bask in the All good right. feeling of this affirmation. Uh, <laughs> Mark Mark was right in uh, is right. Uh, Eugene, you are muted. Uh, Mark I was just saying we'll eventually send them a micropayment for them. <laughs> but Mark is right that. Uh, most people, if they see that they only spent uh, $7 this month on nickel transactions, are, are just going to shrug it off. Um, or, the, or you could cap it, right? You could have a sort of like, you, you know, you set a cap, and that's a great way of having the bartender cut you off. Right, right, or take, right. Or take your keys. Right. Um, the, uh, and there are people for whom that is entirely apropos. So, so can I read? Um, the, the other aspect of the buyer's remorse for a nickel is um, the world's smallest violin playing hearts and flowers. Yeah, you don't have to join, join this. Most people will actually feel a sense of empowerment if by pressing a nickel, they get to buy individual products from the New York Times and be done with the transaction. That's it. It's over. And I have the power to say I want that nickel back, but yeah, that was a nickel's worth of, of, of interesting. The point is humans are varied. American the one, the one, click is, one click has got to be critical to that. that. That is absolutely, you talk about buyer's remorse, that is a small psychological factor compared to what is absolutely proved, and that is um, slowing down surfing. Uh, uh, Clay Shirky says, nobody, nobody will ever pay for anything. That's completely disproved. People will pay. They don't want to be slowed down. And a nickel button. And, and have to log in and have a sort of... Right. You know, you know, now my site's, and it's, we know it's going to be hacked. So I will- And I have to find my password or I have to decide. Right. So, so this, may be, this may be indecorous, but I will raise it anyway. Uh, all other great technologies in the history of the internet uh, are led uh, first and foremost by the pornography industry. <laughs> this is all like, a point. Like Mark, Mark, did you pull that off the question feed, or is this great minds think no, like? Uh, <laughs> yes. Look, those Venus figures that prove prove that we were uh, Gaia worshippers uh, twenty five thousand years ago. Excuse me. What what what's the most obvious use? Uh, <laughs> the point. The the point is the point is that uh, there you're talking about the divided personality of a person who uses the product and then wants to disavow it uh, this is <laughs> no but i'm not sure I, i'm not sure that's the question yeah yeah no i quite the opposite i, I mean this is why the privacy piece becomes really important right so right so, someone who might not want to log into and be a member of a website right me might be perfectly happy to do a one-click transaction uh, if in fact they were comfortable that that uh, uh, transaction is uh, is somehow anonymous, building credibility that you can be trusted to obey the the privacy preferences is going to be one of the major competitive factors in right. uh, in the, in this company uh, building building the, trust. The intermediary that's doing the money. So, can I ask the question? Isn't that just Google? Or Facebook, right? So that is, I, I would love it to be uh, something that breaks up our existing kind of tech uh, monopolies, but why aren't the companies who are already collecting and generating the information the natural intermediaries to do this for us? Well, they might, they might, uh, if they had any sense to realize that this is a competitive with their advertising model, but can ha could be handled internally. Um, the human nature generally says, uh, I'm not going to support something that would eat our own lunch. Uh, and that's what happened to Kodak, which invented the digital camera for crying out loud. Um, Sears, mm. in probably the greatest piece of capitalist stupidity, in 1992, ended their Sears catalog. They had the greatest catalog system in the world, uh, greatest fulfillment system and warehouses in the world. In the very year that Jeff Bezos was starting to, mm. to um, fulfill book orders out of his apartment. Um, so 
whether or not psychologically, and by the way, people can look up my uh, Google talk that I gave just three weeks ago, uh, in which I talked about some of these things. Uh, one topic we could talk about uh, if people want in another of these is um, why Johnny can't code and how Google and Apple and, and Microsoft could solve that almost mm. overnight with, with uh, one FTE employee each. Just going one step, one step back, we, we were just on the point of a really interesting set of issues that there's several questions coming in on, which is about interactions between this Microsoft payment with disavowal system and other potential revenue streams. So uh, a couple of people have asked, would uh, content providers receiving this be expected at some point to reduce third party ads on their sites? Some, a couple of people have asked, wait a sec, as soon as this takes off, doesn't it mean that providers or producers of information who rely upon subscription models would see their revenue streams completely collapse? Um, well, any, you know, any thoughts on those interactions? Absolutely. It goes back to, this, this, this thing might eat our own lunch. And yes, the New York Times would lose some subscribers who say, uh, I'd rather pay a nickel each. The point is that at the beginning, it's found money because those groups are probably going to be separate, a different populations. Over time, you have to be able to say, uh, What's going to happen here? Is this silo going to give way to micropayments where people pay uh, per article? I am not asserting that I know that the one eating the other would wind up being a net benefit. I am not an expert at that. I'm, I'm good at ideas and seeing perspectives and, and seeing things that, that may have been overlooked. <laughs> And that's a comment. That's a comment. The, the, um, the, the point is, though, that it is highly plausible, in fact, obviously likely, that these would be in parallel for a good long time. And then if the silo model is being eaten, it's because it deserves to be. Now, will Will they break their promise that when you press the nickel button, the ads will be considerably muted and shrunk? Yes, Mark, obviously they will try um, over time. Uh, well, so I'm, not I expect sure. I'm, I'm not so sure about that. I wanted to go back to that anyway. And since it's been raised again, I, I don't think it's inevitable that we'll end up in cable territory because what Websites might do is they might actually have two buttons and one button says five cents and the other says No, thanks. Just track me or something like that or a dime and no ads Maybe um, Right, right something like that. and uh, and so, and so I'm actually kind of excited about this model is potentially Not only giving people a choice but educating them about their choices, too um, and if if they're if first movers do something like that, then I, you know, I think that kind of will wind up um, be, it will make it hard for other con content providers to, um, to do something different or without looking at it. I think that's a very important point, Jane. And, and uh, um, look, I, I think that what's fundamental here is, you know, none of us here are in a position to actually start a company to do this. But I think what becomes clear is one of the most important attractive features here is that the startup difficulty of creating this intermediary system without having to uh, convincingly replicate PayPal's level of security um, ought to be, it certainly looks to me, and I am not a businessman, I've never been able to exploit my damn patents and I should own all of augmented reality. Um, but it certainly looks to me as if the entry barrier for creating such an experiment should be much lower than for any previous micropayment system and should be one that, that uh, that content providers like the New York Times would say, you mean all we have to do is put this symbol, clickable symbol at the bottom of our articles and money will come in? 
it, it, it sounds to me like it's something that at least some angel investor might be interested in trying, to, in trying on. So I think that makes a lot of sense, but if I could also uh, buttress, I think, one of the things that Jane was saying, we as consumers have a weapon we didn't really have for cable. Although in a sense, we got at one point got, which was the fast forward. Uh, but we have ad blockers. And right now, the way this dance, the way this chess game perhaps works is, I put on my ad blocker, usually blocks the ads, but some sites sense it and say, uh, you need, to, in order to access our stuff for free, let's say, you need to turn off the ad blocker. And I sometimes grudgingly say, okay, fine, because I can turn it off for the site. All right, so let's say that there is a, uh, 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 that, that I pay five cents. And then I have my ad blocker on, they say, no, 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 you still have to turn off the ad blocker. My guess is that's gonna cause a good deal of customer unhappiness, because they are paid the damn five cents, uh, give, it, give this to me without trying to milk me for more. Now, not all people will say that, but my guess is enough that the typical company is gonna say, we'd like to try to exploit this, maybe by raising the amount to 10 cents, rather than saying once you've paid even this modest amount, now you can't see it unless you do something else extra. I, I think the experiment- can deploy the, yes. Right. And, and yeah. there will be parameters that we don't know right now. Right. What, what we can say is that these parameters will be available to a company that tries this. For instance, a, a nickel button uh, with, with small ads and a dime button with no ads. That's one approach. What, what's clear from this conversation is that parameters that can address these objections are available uh, and can be tried. Uh, one more question, Ted? We got, a, we got a bunch of other good ones. Let me, let me pick from- Maybe We have time for one, maybe. Yeah, we, uh, we only I'm sorry, Mark, do you have to go at three or? Okay. No, so, so we have time, a little bit more time then. We, we, can, we can, we advertise one hour. We can, get, we can, we can stretch Sounds a couple good. of minutes, but not All more. All right, good. Okay, I've, I've, yeah. I'm going to give you two different questions uh, to the group and let you choose. So, so one says, what about tip jar? It was seamless and it failed. Is it a relevant lesson for the applicability and scalability of this model? And then on completely different territory that becomes relevant based on the discussion a moment ago where the response to some questions was, well, make the sum a little bit bigger. If data tracking is dependent on the ability to pay, then doesn't this system imply that privacy becomes a privilege only for the wealthy? So, uh, well, the latter, you know, the latter I, you know, I've been talking about privacy for a very long time. And the, um, the fact is that a privacy needs to be something that we personally can enforce. And we do that through transparency and there's no time to really get into that. The tip jar relies upon people's super ego um, being one that is, is motivated to some degree by guilt and obligation. Now that's fine, I'm all in favor of super egos and guilt and obligation, but there are much better uses for it than wearing it out you know, a hundred times a day with little sayings, can we give me a tip, give me a little bit of tip. And the fact of the matter is this is a business transaction. And anybody who has internet access is going to be able to afford a nickel, you know, 20, 50, 60 times in any given day. Uh, even if it's a quarter, it's highly likely that the poor will not be inconvenienced. Uh, what we're talking about here is something where, um, uh, nevertheless, this is an interesting question, whether or not there might be deluxe, deluxe concierge services like Amazon just declared that there's a membership invitation only portion of Amazon. Geez, it's time for a revolution. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I, I wanted to, I'm sorry. Sorry, Mark. Uh, I was just going to say that's where all the PlayStation 5s went. They're being held for the invitation members. Uh -huh. I, I want to know what Jane has to say about this, because I know she's thought a lot about data and privacy. Well, I guess for first, just generally, privacy, even if privacy becomes something that the wealthy can afford more of, that's already true, and it's probably also true of almost everything. So, this, um, but uh, I look at it kind of in reverse, that... Um, until we had the internet, we mostly had to pay for content, even magazines, which were 
you know, supported by ads, you still had to pay a little something. And it was the internet and its tracking that made a new business model that was more, made things more accessible. And so with that history in mind, um, yeah, we're, we're reestablishing a privilege, but it's, um, well, I, you know, <laughs> it's just harder to, to, to know uh, whether, whether there's some moral culpability with, with providing. Oh, I'm not sure I agree with that. I mean, so you're right. We paid for magazines. We paid for books. We paid for things that had a uh, uh, sort of uh, marginal cost of redistribution. We didn't pay for radio. We didn't pay for television. Right. Uh, and I think it's no accident that the advertising models uh, uh, developed there because they were solving a public goods problem. Right. It's actually really hard to exclude people from listening to your radio or your television. It's not impossible. There are countries, there are developed countries in the world where you have to pay a TV tax. And if you don't pay a TV tax and we think you have a TV, we send government agents around or private copyright owners around to see whether you're, uh, uh, you're cheating. Uh, that just seems like a pretty inefficient way to do things. Well, Advertising it does get back, though, to the Splinternet thing, because television and radio was also when we started seeing segments uh, split up so that the advertising could pitch to the uh, appropriate audience. And But not during the golden age of television, and that's why on my list of... of of um, expansions of vision and, and, and knowledge and, and attention. It's in the 1950s and 60s that television was unifying and uh, McCarthy's victims and Martin Luther King and Gandhi, they all credit television with having saved them. And this reversed the usual thing that happens in new media. Usually the new media are devastating to a society first, and then people get better. Uh, in television's case, it was, it was the opposite, about 25 years in which, and my cousin was Newton Minow, who said that TV was a vast wasteland. Well, maybe so, but it was a unifying wasteland. All of us, uh, Jane, every time now and then you hear uh, guys like Gene and me and, and Ted break out into some t t uh, uh, commercial jingle uh, from, the, from the 60s, you're not missing out. <laughs> but it's, but it's my something only, that we share. My only objection to that is that uh, the golden age of television was from Buffy through Battlestar. Ah. Uh, well, that that is indeed a topic for another conversation. And I have to say, uh, you you folks, you've just steered toward one fabulous area of questioning that I've actually not brought forward from the attendee questions, which is people proposing alternative revenue models. Basically, instead of micropayments with disavowal. Uh, a couple of people have said, what about something like the BBC? A couple of people have said, what about something like NPR, PBS, where there's a combination of funding from general tax revenues, you know, perhaps targeting... And who decides to go? Uh, who decides what is going to be on NPR and PBS and BBC? Uh, yeah, the thing is, what you're talking about is some degree of political consensus. I know those are science fiction sounding words. Yeah, <laughs> right. Political consensus. Politics was this thing, you see, where grown-ups would disagree over maybe 50%, agree upon the other 50%, and then negotiate um, on the parts that they disagreed about. Uh, you can read up about it. And we science fiction authors think that maybe politics might be restored after being deliberately sabotaged for the last 30 years. Uh, having said all that, um, politics decides about some degree of subsidy for certain types of the creation of content, and art museums, NPR, things that help to bring us together. Um, but that has very little to do with micropayments. Micropayments is an attempt to create a market that responds better in an Adam Smithian sense. And as I said, Adam Smith today, I do not think would be with the political party that most mentions his name. Let me, so can I just, because I, I do think the uh, one response to the question, I mean, to me, right, what we want is a pluralistic vision of how content is created and how content is paid for. So I don't think these things are mutually exclusive. Right. Uh, I think you yeah. can have a bunch of content and you do on the Internet created for free just because people like to create because it's now cheap to create because they now have a channel. Right. I mean, that enormous amount of stuff is generated that way. You do have voluntary support mechanisms that work. Right. Uh, uh, lots of things are created through Kickstarter, Indiegogo and so forth. 
um, uh, uh, because people want to support them. Uh, and, and, I think and, and, those things and NPR and micropayments can all coexist because they're serving different niches for the different markets. And also the nickel button can be a tip button also. I mean, it's smoothly right. transitioned right. Right. into a tip button. It just depends on whether or not you have to uh, press it to read past the second paragraph of an article you want, or whether it starts flashing, you know, before the final little dance, TikTok dance they do. Right, making um, Bambi eyes at you. Well, that's, that's right. Um, you know, if you liked this article or this presentation, press, press a nickel to have to see my little thank you dance. Uh, there are so many, the, the thing is that this allows a fluidity of competitive implementations of, uh, of micropayments with disavowal. And I would be disappointed if only one company were handling it. Um, no. It would be a good thing if there were three or four that were, because I believe the barriers for entry to this would be fairly small. Uh, fairly low, uh, fairly low bar. And then if there were three or four to choose from, then uh, the preferences that I talked to Jane about would be uh, part and parcel of the different experience that you'd have in, in, in different implementations of, of this micropayment system. But and, I think- and, 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 Oh, I'm that, sorry, uh, Ted, and on yeah. that point, we're, we're, we're five minutes over our scheduled time. We have a bunch of rich questions teed up. So, so I have to say, one of, the, one of the questions that's come through is a comment. It says, next time you do this, make it 90 minutes. And that sounds exactly spot on to me. So I think, but I think it is time to bring this to a close now. There is one urgent outstanding question that I must pass on. And that is, Jane, what is the name of your dog? Uh, his name is Arthur. He's 17 years old and is deaf and doesn't know what's going on or what time of day it is. So. I'm sure he's very happy. Okay. Except with me at one point. <laughs> well, but who knows what a bark means? It's true. I was being, being self-indulgent at that point. It's interesting that she chose that particular moment to, to bark a chide at me. We are going to do this again. I mean, it's yeah, not yes. again, but we are going to continue this discussion. And so one of the things I'd like to do is get through, get to some of the questions that we didn't discuss uh, as we dig deeper into what the system might look like, uh, how we might avoid the problems and that sort of thing. And, and I think that that could then segue into a discussion of anonymity and pseudonymity, which was yeah. another thing that we discussed. Right, right. Yeah. I think it'd yeah. be very good. There, there are three questions, questions yes. that are up from the panelists and from the and from the attendees who've been sending them via the via the web link. But I think I, I do have to uh, close it now. So, uh, any of you folks who have a you know a ten second or less urgent closing remark, please make it. Well, I'm going to plug my, my <laughs> comedy, the ancient ones. It, it will it will okay. make. You it will make you think that 2020 wasn't all, all um, stupid evil. Uh, this is highly, highly stupid funny. All right. Okay, okay. Uh, Eugene. Uh, I just want to close with one thing that, that, that um, I think came out from what uh, people were saying. There have long been lots of ways of funding things. There's been the king. There have been rich patrons. There were, in the late 1700s, subscriptions where you'd, for, you'd get money from a whole bunch of people, and then the person writes the book, and then there's a little thank you thing there. And then there's copyright, for example, which is also a means of trying to decentralize uh, things with, without decisions by kind of rich and powerful uh, decision makers uh, uh, about what to fund, uh, although at very substantial cost. So one question is, what effect will that have on this very rich ecosystem, supplementary to it, probably for a long time won't replace it. Great, to be continued. Jane and Mark, any urgent brief closing remarks? Okay, then I'm going to say, you folks, you rock. What a fabulous conversation. Thank you so much for all, uh, for, uh, all of the wonderful speakers. Thank you to those participating and attending, particularly for the excellent questions that have been coming through. Uh, thanks to the two sponsoring organizations, Arizona Tech Law and AI Pulse at UCLA Law School, AIPulse.org. And it sounds like there is interest and enthusiasm to continue this conversation, and that sounds like a fabulous idea. So everybody, oh, and I forgot to say thank you doubly to Wei Joan Uden and Laura Elbaum at UCLA Law, who handled the preparation and technical management of this. And 
Uh, stay tuned for announcement of the next time. Thank you all so much. And many thanks to you, Ted, for keeping us all on an even keel to the extent such a thing was possible. Okay, make it so. Bye-bye. <laughs>